Hi guys, I'm back and this is our last lecture in soil science for the semester. So yay, we're almost done. And this is kind of about soil biology, the organisms, primarily um, microbial or small sized um, organisms that live in the soil, but of course there's some bigger ones too. Um, they're very important. We've referenced them throughout the semester. So let me share my slideshow and then we can get started. Um, okay. So, so first of all, when we think about um, microbes, uh, microbes are just organisms that are small, like we would need a microscope to see them, they're microscopic, they're small in size, and they are everywhere. Um, they're everywhere on plants and trees, above ground, in our gut, on our skin, but they're also very, very prevalent in the soil. And so, um, many soil scientists kind of reference this idea that if you took one handful of soil, kind of scooped it up in your hand, you would probably hold, be holding over a billion organisms. So that really kind of gives you a clue that even if there's not big things that you can see, like an earthworm or a beetle, um, there are a lot of living organisms, there's a lot of life that's teeming in the soil. And so we've also mentioned throughout the year that we as organisms that live above the ground and are very dependent on light to be able to kind of understand the world around us, um, we are very focused on those organisms that we can see above ground. But in fact, there's um, very much uh, likely to be more organisms both by number and by mass um, and by diversity below ground than above ground. So there's just an enormous, again, diversity and number of organisms living down there. And um, the importance of these organisms is extensive and we'll kind of be going through that um, throughout this lecture. But this large biological and kind of genetic diversity of very, very many different kinds of organisms is important because all these different organisms have slightly different functions that they provide provide in the ecosystem. And so the more biologic diversity we have in any ecosystem or in any economy, um, we have more functional diversity. We have more different kinds of things that are going on. Um, and that's good. There's a lot of different jobs to be done in the soil. So the more biologic diversity we have in the soil is usually an indicator of soil quality. Um, and it's an indicator that we have a lot of functional redundancy within our soil. So for instance, if we have several different bacteria that are responsible for transforming nitrogen in the atmosphere into a bioavailable form of nitrogen that plants can absorb, that's good because if something happens to one of those organisms with a soil pH change or a climate change, then we're gonna have other backups um, other kind of organisms that are able to do that same job and that's good. That makes us more stable and that makes us more resilient to different kinds of changes that are inevitable in our environments. Um, and then this picture on the right is a picture of many different kinds of organisms, primarily bacteria um, that we see in the soil. So they come in different kinds of shapes. A lot of these different kinds of rods and whatnot are little bacterial organisms. Um, so, um, just kind of to remind you, going back to a little basic biology, um, again, the, the many of the organisms that we are very focused on, that we have relationships with, that we think about, um, are those kind of macroscopic large organisms, like other animals that we can see, large plants that we can see above the ground. And these organisms are actually a very, very small part of the whole kind of tree of life that contains all the different kinds of um, organisms that are out there. So we have different kinds of many, many single celled organisms in the bacteria and archaea kind of branches of the tree of life. And then um, eukarya, eukaryotic cells are kind of more compl complex um, cells. We're not going to get into a full biology lesson about this, um, but these include things like plants and animals and fungi, um, um, also protists um, that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and um, yeah, they are important, but they're actually small compared to the huge diversity of organisms that exist on the planet and then of course within the soil as well. 
So um, we're going to kind of go through and take the view that your book takes a little bit, which is we're going to kind of divide and conquer um, or, you know, divide and educate ourselves about some of these different important groups of organisms that live in the soil kind of by size. So we're going to be thinking about macroscopic large organisms that we can see like a gopher, meso, um, you know, kind of medium-sized organisms, small organisms, but that are not microscopic, and then microscopic organisms. And we're going to um, think about those rather than kind of strictly breaking up these different organisms into their kind of genetic or biological differences. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of a different way to classify and think about groups of organisms that are in the soil. Um, so a kind of another way that we could think about organisms that are in the soil is by functional groups. So we can think about how the organisms kind of go about um, processing their basic functions. And the most important function of any living organism is to get energy. Um, so we could think of two broad groups of organisms in the soil as autotrophic as opposed to heterotrophic organisms. Um, so these are terms you may have heard of in biology in the past, but to review, an autotrophic organism is something like a plant, an algae, um, some other kinds of um, bacteria can do this as well. And in this case, they are able to capture carbon dioxide and then use some energy source, typically from the sun, in order to produce organic carbon um, in the form of sugars that then their bodies can break down to get the energy that they need. So they essentially make their own food from, again, energy, usually sunlight and CO2. So obviously humans cannot do this, other animals cannot do this, fungi cannot do this, protists cannot do this. Um, and so all these other organisms are called heterotrophic organisms, which essentially means they, instead of autotrophic, they don't eat themselves. Heterotrophic is they eat something else, something that's different from them. So they have to ingest organic carbon from another sort of organism. So we have to either eat an animal that ate a plant, or we have to eat a plant, or we have to eat a fungi that absorbed energy from decomposing plants and other animals, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this would include all different kinds of functional groups like herbivores, carbo, um, carnivores, and decomposers. Um, all of those, whether again, you're like that fungi that's absorbing energy from a dead um, plant nearby, whether you're a carnivore eating meat, whether you're an herbivore, in all of those cases, you're a heterotrophic organism. And then even within those groups, there can be, of course, many, many more classifications we can make, and we won't get into all of these. But one that can be important in the context of soil science is that of those organisms that are charged with decomposing dead and dying organisms, we can think of um, detritivores as opposed to saprophytes. So detritivores are sometimes considered to be organisms that um, can't break down cellulose, which is kind of a stringy fiber. If you think of like celery, all those like stringy um, fibers in the soil. And they're often herbivores and they're often um, kind of bacterial films that live on the surface of um, organisms that are dead um, or dying. Um, and they kind of break down some of the cells types, but not cellulose. And then saprophytes on the other hand, um, often eat, uh, live off kind of dead and dying tissue, but they have an ability to break down um, kind of more thoroughly more different kinds of cell types um, in the organism. So anyway, that's kind of a distinction it talks about in your book a little bit. And then here's a picture of a biofilm, different kinds of bacteria um, acting on a lettuce leaf and kind of eating down, eating um, some of the um, cells so, and getting energy from this lettuce type. Okay, so um, just like in any other ecosystem that you've learned about in the past, we know that there are basically complex webs where energy is passed from one organism to another, kind of um, in a simplified way, like up a food chain. Um, we know that the idea of food chains is actually probably oversimplified. Um, in fact, there's many different ways that energy can pass through different chains of organisms. Um, but here's kind of one kind of simplified 
food web that shows um, original organic matter. So that might be plants, that might be plant roots, that might be live or dead plants, that might be other organic matter like leaves that have fallen off trees or poop from a bear that walks by or a horse that walks by or, an, or a bacteria that has died. And that would provide what's called the first trophic level, the first kind of level of organic carbon. And then the second trophic level would be the organisms that directly um, absorb energy from those first organisms. So in the soil, that might be a bacteria, that might be a fungi, or that might be an animal, like a small um, nematode, which is a kind of round worm um, that kind of might be munching on plant roots. And then we would have another layer of the food chain, which we would call the third trophic level, that might be like a bigger protist or protozoa, maybe a different nematode, maybe an arthropod, different kinds of insects um, that would be eating the smaller nematodes or eating the bacteria or eating the fungi. And then we might have a fourth trophic level of larger ne nematodes, larger insects that are eating the other organisms. And then we might have an even bigger um, or sort of a continued um, level within the trophic system, maybe like a gopher or a mole or a mouse or a ground squirrel or a bird that's um, either going down into the soil or moving around on the surface of the soil and eating um, these um, organisms from there. So when we think about what are the important roles that organisms have in the soil, it's important to remember that one of the important roles is just that all these organisms kind of provide an important place within this soil food web or food chain, and they provo provide an important, basically, pathway um, for energy to move around um, in this ecosystem. And as we start to take parts out of the ecosystem, the system kind of breaks down. So if we're extensively spraying to remove insects or nematodes, we might not only be affecting that part of the soil food web, but we might be having unintended consequences on other components of the soil food web that might then feed back later to have undesirable consequences, not just to that organism, but to kind of the soil functioning and soil health as a whole. Okay, so we'll talk about, um, again, animals kind of, or sort of organisms in terms of size, as I mentioned a few slides back. So macro, again, are the largest organisms. And again, your book kind of breaks down the different organism groups by size, but then also into kind of fauna and flora. So usually that refers to fauna as animals and flora as plants. Um, and so anyway, we'll kind of follow that pattern. But we have mentioned already that there's many different kinds of animals um, that live in the soil, many of which we can see quite clearly with our naked eye. So like a gopher, an earthworm, many insects, ants, termites, and these organisms have important roles in the soil. They um, uh, participate in pedoturbation, which is basically like mixing of the soil. They move the soil around as they move around in the soil and they aerate the soil. So they have an important job to do kind of creating these macro pore channels for infiltration and for oxygen access kind of deeper down in the soil. And in particular, um, earthworms um, have been kind of famously considered to be um, extremely efficient kind of soil producers. They can break down different kinds of plant matter or other matter and kind of um, poop it out essentially. So earthworm casts or earthworm castings as they're sometimes called um, are an important component of many um, soils and um, there's many, many, many different kinds of worms um, and earthworms. So it's not all just like the classic earthworm that you might think of if you've like gotten earthworms to go fishing or something before, um, but the pattern is similar. And these earthworm castings are very um, important in the soil because they are very rich in plant available nutrients. So the, the organic matter has been broken down in the gut of the worm into very simplified forms that might be able to be absorbed by plants. Um, they um, exude these different kinds of kind of sticky sugar compounds. So they give structural stability to the soil by helping form soil colloids um, and soil aggregates. Um, they contribute to CEC, 
cation exchange capacity in the soil. So they have an important role. And let me um, start this video clip real quick um, that kind of shows um, an important job that earthworms can do in the soil. So this is kind of a time-lapse video showing these earthworms crawling around in the soil, eating um, the leaves from these deciduous trees, right? Trees that lose their leaves in the winter. And um, you can see how they're kind of making quick work and turning this large scale um, organic matter um, into earthworm poop, which is an important component of soil. Um, and it's not just earthworms, you can see other different kinds of arthropods, little roly-poly bugs and other insects also crawling, crawling around and munching on this. Um, really some small, very microscopic organisms that if you look closely, you might be able to see as well. Um, and over the course of, I'm actually not quite sure how long this video clip is, probably months, um, they are turning in this O horizon layer, um, essentially into more A horizon layer. So I find this to be pretty impressive. All right, I think you get the idea. I'll, I'll stop, stop this here. Okay, back to our PowerPoint. Um, okay, so there are many, many kinds of organisms that we can't see so well in the soil with our naked eye that are also extremely important to soil function. So first of all, we'll start with some animals. So I mentioned before, nematodes are round worms. And on the top, um, right, there's a picture of a nematode with some of its mouth parts there. And these are extremely important in soil nutrient cycling and soil function. Um, they release an enormous amount of plant available nitrogen, taking things like a leaf that we can't um, really turn directly into food for root uptake to plants and then turning it into a form that a simple small form compound that plants can absorb and so probably about 30 percent of the nitrogen um, or as much as 40 percent of the nitrogen in an ecosystem has kind of gone through the gut of a nematode on its way from sort of a dead piece of organism back through the cycle um, through the soil through plant roots um, and so that's a lot. So nematodes provide an uh, um, incredibly important role. And then some of my favorite organisms, which are not only soil organisms that live above ground as well, but are just really cool and really crazy, are here on the bottom. And these are called pterygrades, which are also sometimes referred to as water bears or moss piglets. Um, and these look like they're fake. They look like they're some weird sort of science fiction um, organism, but in fact, they're real organisms that live in the soil, that live on plant leaves, that live on moss and lichens, um, and they are munching away on stuff in the soil and providing part of this soil um, food web um, all the time. So look out, they're all around you and they're amazing. Okay, so then on the smallest sized microfauna, um, so those are again, um, not the plants, um, we have what are called um, different kind of protists or protozoa. And these organisms are microscopic, so we can't see them easily with our naked eye, but they're bigger than bacteria. So they are eating bacteria. Um, and they um, often can't get inside different kinds of um, intra-aggregate um, soil. So let me rephrase that. So Within um, an ag a soil aggregate, um, there are little tiny micropore spaces that bacteria can occupy, but these protists cannot occupy. And so those areas provide important refuges for soil bacteria and probably leads to why we have so many bacteria that are allowed to remain in the soil 
because if those hiding places didn't exist, there probably would be um, greater kind of carnivory by um, these different kinds of protists and other organisms that, or nematodes that would be munching on the soil bacteria. Anyway, that's interesting. Um, and these protists, as well as some other larger animals like um, the water bears that we just talked about, have kind of interesting capabilities um, where they can go into a state that's called cryptobiosis. And that basically means they look almost like they're dead, but they're still alive. So it's kind of like this extreme hibernation phase that many of these organisms that can go into when their environmental conditions get disturbed. So like if it's very, very dry at the end of a summer season or very, very hot or very, very cold, um, they can kind of go into this extreme hibernation phase and survive for a long time, years, months, decades in some cases, and then kind of um, jump back into the game and um, like regain their metabolic capability um, once the environmental conditions become favorable again. Favorable again. And this also, of course, leads to um, better soil diversity because these organisms are able to survive in some cases even when the soil conditions change. So that's pretty an impressive evolutionary adaptation. Okay, so now kind of getting into the flora, kind of the, the plant-based um, organisms. Um, we'll first of all talk, talk about some meso and microflora. So First of all, we've already mentioned that plant roots are an enormously extensive and important component um, within the soil. So about 50% of the plant biomass exists below the ground, right? We are very focused on the above ground part. So when you look up at a big tree or a corn plant, you often don't like look down at the ground and then think, wow, that is mirrored under the ground as well. Um, this is a famous um, kind of uh, image on the top um, that's included in like almost every single soil science textbook ever, um, but it shows the kind of above ground and below ground parts of many different kinds of um, Midwestern prairie plants, um, but kind of, again, gives you a good idea of how much soil biomass is down there, or sorry, how much plant biomass is down within the soil. And um, these plant roots are, have a lot of surface area, and that's good because the more surface area they have, the more water and nutrients they can absorb. And they can increase their um, surface area even more than you might imagine, because if you zoom in up close on any of these little root strings that you can see with your naked eye, those root strings would be covered in root hairs. And there's some interesting research that shows um, the soil conditions um, in which a plant is growing actually influence how many soil or, or how many root hairs it grows. And so in some cases when we're um, using too much like synthetic nitrogen or phosphorus or spraying too many pesticides or insecticides um, or herbicides in the soil, we actually um, create plant roots that grow without a lot of root hair and then those plants um, have a difficulty surviving then without water and then without really kind of easy access pulses of nutrients that then we need to continue to give them synthetically because they can't absorb them from the soil. That's kind of a, an aside. But anyway, um, these plant roots are extensive. They're everywhere. They have these little root hairs. Um, at least healthy plants do. Um, and they are um, an important way that we transfer energy and material from the soil um, into the soil food web and the terrestrial food web above. Um, we also know that plant roots have an important job in creating um, macropore space and aerating the soil by kind of pushing down into the soil and creating these bigger channels. Um, we also know that plant roots play an important process in weathering of parent material to build soil all the time. And we also know that plant roots exude a lot of sugars into the soil that can help um, bond different kinds of soils together to form aggregates and stable aggregates. And they also exude a lot of acids into the soil that help break down um, other organic matter um, so that they can absorb nutrients more easily. So they're influencing the kind of chemical and physical structure of the soil around them. 
Um, we also have a lot of um, algae that exist in certain kinds of soils. It depends, of course, on the environment, right? Because algae live in water, usually wet environments. So there's some soil algae that um, live there. Um, but in most soils, um, or at least in most parent material environments, we have at least some lichen existing. So lichen um, is famously this kind of symbiotic um, partnership between fungi and algae. And lichen grow on rocks and are one of the most important organisms that contribute to weathering of parent material to form soils. So that would be another way that plants are um, important in the formation and health of soil. Um, okay, so then if we think about fungi, um, which are also often considered in the flora category. Um, I'm not really sure why that would be, but that's just kind of a common way that they're categorized with the plants as opposed to the animals. Um, and fungi like bacteria have an enormous diversity in the soil. Um, many soil biologists estimate that there's at least 1 million unidentified species of soil fungi. So that's just like what we don't know about, um, which is impressive. And the different life stages of these fungi can exist in microscopic, um, kind of meso, middlescopic, and macroscopic versions. And we've probably all interacted with kind of microscopic spores, as well as observed large, um, you know, fruiting bodies of fungi in the form of mushrooms, or like puffballs, or conchs growing on trees, and maybe we've seen the kind of mycelial mats, which are almost like roots um, of fungi that exist under the ground that I have pictured in kind of the left-hand side of the pictures here. Um, so mycelial mats are kind of more shown in the bottom left picture. They're made up of what are called hyphae, which are kind of the individual kind of strings of cells that grow out into the soil that are pictured on the left top. And then I mentioned this term before, fruiting bodies. Um, the bottom I have um, a morel mushroom or two morel mushrooms and on the top a turkey tail kind of fungi. Um, and those are both kind of like the sexual reproductive parts um, of the fungi that come up above ground to disperse spores um, into the air. Anyway, um, fungi are very prevalent within soil, particularly in forested ecosystems. Um, bacteria tend to be a little bit more dominant in grasslands, while fungi tend to be a little bit more dominant in um, more forested or woodland ecosystems, um, but both exist in both, um, and they are everywhere. I think we mentioned before that the largest um, uh, organism that we know of on the planet is a large um, honey mushroom um, that is found in Oregon. Oh, I put in the slide about it. Um, so this is an armillaria type of mushroom, a honey fungus, and this particular um, organism is all connected underground to the same mycelial mat. So it's all genetically identified, um, identical, it's all the same organism, but there's many different fruiting bodies, little individual mushrooms that pop out of the same mycelial mat. And it uh, covers nine square kilometers, which is the size of 1,600 football fields all stitched together. So that's a pretty impressive organism. And that's the kind of thing that we don't always see in quite that big of a form, but in very extensive forms all throughout soil in many, many different soil environments. Um, so one of the really important roles that fungi play is in the different kinds of mycorrhizal relationships that they farm. So mycorrhizae is my least favorite word to try to spell. I have spell checked it here. That's how it's spelled, but I always spell it wrong on the board. Um, anyway, what it means is a fungus root. So myco is fungus in Latin, rhizae is root. So it's a fungus root relationship. Um, it is ubiquitous, meaning it's found extensively everywhere throughout the environment. The more we look, the more we find. And basically these are relationships where the fungi that live in the soil and the roots of plants actually grow together. And this is advantageous to both the fungi and the plants. 
Um, so it's a mutualistic relationship that's formed, sometimes called a symbiotic relationship that's formed between these two organisms. And in the case of the fungi, um, the fungi have even more surface area than plant roots. Um, so they increase the efficiency of absorption of nutrients in water because of their greater surface area um, and their greater ability to exude acids into the soil to break down things and absorb them better. Also, the presence of a particular fungi around a plant root will kind of block the ability for other fungi and other bacteria to move in and colonize that area. So it can protect a plant from other kind of harmful fungi and bacteria. And then on the other hand, plants have the ability to photosynthesize. They have the ability to make organic carbon, um, which is the basic energy source that all living organisms need. And fungi can't do this. They have to absorb sugars from their environment. And so plants can pass the fungi the extra sugars that they have, as long as the fungi continue to plant, pass the plants extra water and nutrients that they have. And many studies have started to realize that in many cases, plants probably can't even absorb um, all the nutrients that they would need without the help of these mycorrhizal fungi. In particular, certain nutrients like phosphorus are probably um, impossible for plants to absorb on their own, but they need these relationships with fungi to be able to get what they need. So they live in a little community, um, just like humans, where we have different jobs and we have to work together. Um, so unfortunately, um, all the physical disturbance that has been um, recently part of kind of our conventional agricultural models, um, where we have multiple kind of tillage um, passes over soil throughout the year, has done um, a pretty um, pretty good job of disturbing a lot of these fungal. Um, elements and mycelial mats that are in the soil. So they've really broken down this my, um, microbial network. And again, so the plants that are now growing in these environments with much less fungi um, around um, have to essentially be spoon fed nutrients through um, addition of expensive and synthetic fertilizers um, because they have uh, no longer the ability to work with these fungal organisms that were historically in the soil. Um, to be able to help them kind of furnish their water and nutrient needs. Um, so as we want to think about restorative um, agriculture and soil practices, um, we want to already, as I've emphasized, probably try to uh, minimize um, physical soil disturbance to soil whenever possible. But then also we can work to inoculate the soil, which basically means adding fungal spores back to the soil to try to increase the rate at which these different um, fungal communities are able to kind of recover and grow in the soil. Um, and then the picture on the bottom I have here shows different kinds of um, mycorrhizal um, growth patterns. And so um, mycorrhizae are very broad and very complex, but there's two main groups. There's a group that's called endomycorrhizal and ectomycorrhizal fungi. So ectomycorrhizal means that the fungi basically grow up to the surface of the plant and grow along the surface of the plant and the exchange of nutrients, water, and sugar happens on the skin of the plant. Um, whereas endomycorrhizal fungi um, actually grow into the plant root itself and kind of it's insert themselves among the interior cells of the plant root. And so they're kind of um, within the plant and doing the exchange from the inside. So they're really growing together as one. Um, anyway, and as I think I already mentioned, the more we look for these things, we more, the more we see they're everywhere um, and they're so fundamental to the success of both organismal groups. Okay, so, um, Bacteria and archaea are sometimes considered in the flora group too, um, in the kind of plant fungi bacterial group. And um, at the very beginning of the lecture, we kind of mentioned that there's a difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. We said prokaryotic cells are more simplified, probably an, an older version of what cells used to look like back to the origin of life on our planet. Um, they lack a true nucleus of the cell, which in more complex eukaryotic cells contains um, like much of our DNA and some other functions. Um, so like the animals and the plants and the 
fungi all have eukaryotic form cells, but bacteria and archaea have this more simple prokaryotic form. Anyway, they are also very, very extensive. We've likely only identified 0.1% of all the species of bacteria and archaea out there. Um, that's amazing to think about how much is out there that we just don't even know about yet. Um, and one thing that's challenging about bacteria and archaea is our idea of what defines a species in the case of plants and animals and fungi, where, you know, organisms of the same species can work together to create a new offspring. Um, in some cases, it's hard to apply to the bacterial and archaeal world. Um, they do a lot of asexual reproduction. And anyway, this, our traditional species comp, um, concept is a little bit difficult to apply. So it can make it difficult to kind of draw the boundary between one species and another. But regardless, they are extensive, they're ubiquitous, and they're so foundational to soil function. One of the important roles that they um, are involved in is nitrogen fixation. So we've mentioned this term um, before in class, and um, you might remember that that's the process of taking nitrogen from the air and turning it into a bioavailable form of nitrogen, like a nitrate, a nitrogen oxygen compound, um, or kind of an ammonia um, type, um, or ammonium ion, or nitrogen hydrogen compound that plants can absorb. Um, also, bacteria are very important in um, controlling oxidation and reduction reactions that we mentioned a few weeks ago. So they change the form of nutrients and how they might be mobile in the soil or toxic in the soil. Um, and so they can kind of influence different um, nutrient um, availability. Um, nitrification reactions um, are another um, transformation um, between nitrification is what? Um, nit nitrate to nitrate, I forget. Anyway, it's another um, transformation of um, different kinds of nitrogen compounds in the soil that make them accessible to different kinds of plants. And all these are being um, kind of catalyzed and controlled by bacteria. So um, here's two pictures of bacteria. Um, on the right are some uh, bacillus bacteria, which are the raw types of bacteria. Um, and then in this case, they're kind of surrounding some different kinds of root hyphae. And then um, over here on the right, we have a um, bacteria, the same broad shaped bacteria in the background, and then a protist or a protozoa um, on the top that is kind of munching on the bacteria. So again, many of these look, things look kind of science fiction-y, but this is the real deal. What we can see with a microscope exists underneath the soil. Um, oh, we'll skip that. Um, okay, so just to kind of review um, ecological functions that are important for different organismal groups in the soil, um, breaking down um, and decomposing organic material and recycling it and transforming it into um, bioavailable forms is a imp really important role that many different soil organisms participate in. Um, many organisms can also break down and transform toxic compounds um, and transform them perhaps through oxidation reduction or through other chemical processes um, into non-toxic forms or sometimes into toxic forms in certain environmental conditions. So that's an important thing to keep an eye on. Um, they can influence um, inorganic transformations. So tra um, making certain things soluble or insoluble or bioavailable, plant available, and not plant available, important kind of control that they might have. Um, nitrogen fixation, we just mentioned, and then rhizobacteria um, are bacteria that can help um, uh, plant growth promotion by doing things like participating in those mycorrhizal relationships that we talked about. So these, this kind of a summary of some of the important ecological functions. Um, okay, that's, that's what I have for you about this topic.